Good morning and good day, everyone. Welcome to Harassus' session on how AI and, and automation are transforming cybersecurity compliance. I am Ben Wilcox, ProArk's Chief Technology Officer of Cybersecurity and Cloud. For today's session, I am joined by Stan Engelbrecht from D3 Security, Scott Kufer from Nucleus Security, and Stefan Schockinger from Barracuda Networks. Thank you everyone for joining today. To set some context for our discussion, let's describe some of the challenges we are seeing today in the cybersecurity space. Vulnerabilities are at an all-time high. Tenable uh, recently released some numbers from 2021 that shows a 183% increase in vulnerabilities um, publicized in 2021 over 2015 numbers. The security community faced the largest public exploit to have ever existed, Log4j, which surfaced in December, just in time for Christmas. We're being met by cyber criminal activity at an all-time high. We're seeing cybercrime damages at a cost 100% higher than six years ago. That figure was into the trillions now. We're seeing new ransomware variants and new techniques being used. Right? Cyber criminals are are working together to attack specific industries. Just recently in leaked this week, a ransomware gang coordinated attack against 400 plus um, healthcare businesses all at once. So these things are happening at, at all points at this time and, and they're constantly changing. Uh, within the tech space, you know, employees and third parties are introducing new risks to our businesses, right? We have a distributed workforce and a shift to work from home. The data is leaving the traditional boundaries that we've set uh, for our corporate data centers, and the traditional security controls are no longer meeting those. To try to combat that, we've we've increased our cybersecurity side of it, and you know, organizations are adding new members to their cybersecurity teams, but we're still facing talent shortages. ISACA recently reported that 61% of security teams uh, feel understaffed at this moment. They also reported that 55% of organizations say that they have unfilled cybersecurity positions and that the time frame to hire new staff is take between three to six months for the average cybersecurity position today. So with all of this coming to a head at once, organizations are in the need to reconsider their existing security practice and reframe them. Right? We're moving away from this decentralized security model, which is shifting uh, the focus of IT being um, a centralized function to more of a business function. So we also need to rethink technology. People are becoming increasingly frustrated with the complex modern security solutions, right? We're, we're combining cloud, hybrid, meaning on-premise and, and, and cloud together. You know, we have a human capital constraint and efficient cybersecurity uh, model needs to start shifting from point solutions to a mess, mesh type architecture where solutions can integrate with each other to add efficiencies. So with our ever-expanding digital footprint, including now homes, cloud services, departmental services, you know, SaaS-based services, and other areas that are introducing gaps, you know, we need to um, add in additional capabilities to monitor, to protect our businesses, protect our data, and add incident response capabilities. To navigate these challenges, we need to operate more quickly, accurately, and effectively. And one of those mechanisms is artificial intelligence, AI, and automation to monitor, mitigate, detect, and stop these threats in real time without human intervention. So with all those things kind of as a context, you know, at the highest level, cybersecurity functions can be rolled up into a few different functional levels. Identification, protection, response, detection, and recovery. Where do AI and automation fit into the cybersecurity strategy? And what function of those that we just talked about, the identification, protection, detection, response, or recovery would benefit the most from AI or automation? So maybe we could start with your thoughts, Scott. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Um, hey, good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, honestly, this is a great question. And I think we need to start with really an honest assessment of where we're at as an industry as well as looking at what, what our available tools are to address kind of the path forward. 
right? We're based on just the, the introduction that Ben has given so far. I mean, it's it's quite clear that we're in a situation where things could very quickly spin out of control and come to a head. And so when we're looking at these new techniques and methodologies on how we can improve, um, we're starting to see kind of a, a divergence in the increase of capabilities of enterprises and on the defensive side and the op the offensive operations that are going on all the time um, you know, around the world. And so when we look at AI and automation, this is one of the, the main tools where I think kind of like where nuclear fusion is like in that thing that at energy companies and everybody's saying, hey, that's that's our way to renewable future. In a lot of ways, AI and automation are kind of that for us in the in the cybersecurity industry. And I will say, like, like from our assessment and what we're seeing is we're still in the very early days of automation and AI. Like, there's so much more potential of what we can do with it that we have not even cracked the nut on. And, and so what we like to do here at Nucleus is kind of look at some of the, the historic ways that AI and automation have been used um, and sort of where those fit and how, how they actually did. So one of the things that we look at, for example, is how EDR vendors have come onto the space using AI, I would say this is one of the first real uses of AI in cybersecurity. And when you compare that to the signature based McAfee's of the world, you know, from the early 2000s, you know, even when EDR first came onto the onto the block, it really wasn't that much better uh, than the traditional signature based. But having that heuristics and pattern recognition really started to take uh, over pretty quickly, um, you know, from the signature based way of way of doing things. And so when we're starting to look at sort of all the other places where AI and automation can fit in, um, this is what we're trying to kind of see is where are those specific opportunities to start improving things across the board? Um, and so in our opinion here, uh, what I'm seeing is that there's just a ton more data that's being generated. Like everybody wants to put everything in data lakes. There's all of these, this, uh, this push towards getting more and more data. But see, there's there's ramifications to doing that. And it's great to have all this data, but you have no you have no ability to actually manage it and, and do anything with it. And so my personal opinion is that the biggest real potential opportunity for automation and AI is data analysis. We should be focusing on places where team members are getting completely overwhelmed and we should be trying to shift the work and shift the, the problems that we're seeing from the uh, response side, which is really where a lot of this AI is happening, like in, in sims and automation and things there, and trying to shift to a more proactive approach. So that's really where we're where we're trying to see the biggest opportunities is really in that identify and protect space, um, which we feel is going to be most impactful going forward. How are you, Stefan? Any thoughts? Yeah, good, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, yeah, Ben, this, uh, based on the process you described to beginning with identification, protection, uh, detection, response, and recovery, I'd say, of course, the, the earlier in the process, the better it is, uh, because it, the ultimate goal is to avoid having to recover at all, obviously. Also, this is also a continuous cycle, so it, it does not stop. So it's, it's ongoing. It has to be done basically every day again and therefore i think especially in the uh identification and protection steps there is a lot of potential for automation and ai because it's not possible to keep up to date with manual works so we also have to understand the situation or the threats we are facing are basically changing every day the environment is changing so it's really a recurring process that needs to stay up to date as as good as possible but also, admittedly, I think the identification is still, from a technical point of view, one of the easiest steps involved here because it's basically automatic probing whether a system is vulnerable or not, and then making a, a suggestion to the security operations team on how that situation can be solved or what countermeasures can be taken to protect an organization against those threats. Um, in my opinion, one of the most difficult step here is actually the detection of an ongoing attack because an ongoing attack contains of many steps uh, that are taken continuously. So it basically begins with uh, information gathering, a research phase, also collecting data, picking a victim at the very beginning, then uh, the bad guys will try to get the foot in the door, maybe using phishing, phishing email or social engineering attack or something like that. And then from there, usually the procedure is to uh, move on local network, so try to move from the client systems to server systems or to industrial control systems, for instance, and along the way also escalate the privileges. So an actual 
attack is is a complicated procedure and it's difficult to detect it because you're dependent on information coming from various distant, different systems like SCUT already described and for a person it is not possible to collect all that information or read through the information and aggregate it uh, uh, also drawing the, the right conclusion based on the information we have and there I think is the biggest potential for AI to really put things into a uh, into a relation, like something's happened here and something else has happened there. What does that mean for the organization? And, and that's the potential for AI to detect it and to make, at the end of the day, a suggestion for a person how what to do about it. Well, that, that makes a lot of sense. How about you, Stan? Yeah, I'm. You know what? I'm going to piggyback off of both what Scott and Stefan said. Um, from the perspective of our industry, which is essentially the SOAR uh, perspective. So now we're talking about more on the human level. So, you know, going back to the people that are having to deal with this, with all of the the ingestions, the threats and everything else like that, uh, the ability to automate and correlate, you know, between those events and have a centralized area where you're, you're, you're not having to pick or or move through things in a manual fashion because there's just, you know, you know, Scott, so there's just too much data, right? Like there's, there's so much data that, that that's going on there. And, you know, Stefan pointed out between the detect and the response phase, things can constantly change and there needs to be a method where um, platforms can actually correlate around that type of data and give the analysts up to date information on the fly as that as they're going um, I think it's probably one of the I think it's probably one of the biggest areas for ROI in terms of time saved and resource saves when it comes to automating uh, processes that are in there. Um, you know, if a SOC doesn't have to worry, you know, about looking at all the data sources individually, uh, trying to centralize them manually, I mean, we still still see it where people are cutting and pasting from different different areas into like an Excel sheet or a Word doc on an ongoing incident. Um, you're I mean, they're going to be miles, miles behind at that particular point because, like, how there's, there's no way that 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 you're going to be able to be able to keep up with it. Um, you know, instead, you know, having the platform automate those types of repetitive tasks, present the enriched data to the analysts as they're moving ahead. Um, you know, on those data points, it it's going to take their it's going to take the ability for an analyst to make a decision down from probably um, minutes or hours because honestly, I think the response time still is up in the hours to a lot of these things, um, you know, down to, down to presenting the analyst with decision-making ability within minutes, um, you're going to get far fewer burnt out. You're going to get, you know, burnout when it comes to people that are dealing with the, with the amount of data they have to deal with. And um, just takes a lot of the, a lot of the uh, repetitive horribleness out of, out of what they have to do in a day to day. So I think from an automation AI perspective, um, you know, I think they're. I think both Scott and Stefan are dead on. Like it, it, it needs to. It needs to happen at at, at some lower levels there. Yeah, and I, I certainly will. You know, where I see some of these benefits specifically are right, that what you're talking about. That mean time to detection, mean time to response. Those are two really important pieces when you start getting into active um, threat um, responses and, and trying to drive those down because those. That's the difference between. Um, you know, being able to proactively stop that threat before it goes too far or um, determining it right that this is a big risk and we got to do something else here. Um, so, you know, automation and AI certainly will be very important in those pieces. The identification and protect, um, is certainly I, I agree with you also on that, Scott. Those are very important areas that we need to invest in because, you know, that's where the risk is starting, right? We're, we're starting with these um, open areas or these risky you know, behaviors, whether they're user behaviors or, or you know, system vulnerabilities. So those are, those are good pieces on there too. And detection is certainly hard, right? We, we need to have as much insight into this big lake of data that we have um, to, to kind of bring everything together so we know how to respond. So, Let's move on to the second uh, input here, which is cybersecurity isn't just about stopping threats, right? It's ultimately about risk mitigation. Um, 
know, that's why all of the cybersecurity practices exist within businesses today. We want to mitigate that risk. But you know, risk mitigation can fall under many different areas. But one of them is explicitly protecting business value. So what are some ways that you've seen organizations that um, leverage cybersecurity automation and AI not only to preserve this business value, but use it as a mechanism to increase business value? So let's start with Stan. So um, I'm going to start, we'll, we'll, we'll utilize a cycle above um, that you mentioned sort of in, in question one, which is, you know, identify, protect, detect, res uh, respond, and, and recover. I think within the identi identify and protect, um, if you start viewing your cybersecurity cyber posture more from a preventative standpoint than purely a reactionary standpoint, um, is probably step one in there. Now, where you can leverage um, automation on that side of it, and I'll go back to like the SOAR definition, um, it was born out of automated response. Right, it's or, you know, security orchestration, automated response on that side of it. But what we're seeing is we're seeing more and more people um, utilizing SOAR technologies in a proactive manner rather than purely a reactive manner. So, for example, um, automating the collection of threat and vulnerability feeds coming into the system. So they've got a team um, that may be their cyber threat intelligence team. It may be part of their TVM team. But what they're doing is they're they're utilizing the automation side of it to bring in these feeds in a method where, um, again, going back to the being able to correlate a lot of data um, ahead of time. So they're pulling in the feeds. And then what they're doing is they're using automation to go and sift to their find out which ones are, you know, the ones that are, you know, most impactful to the, to their particular industry, maybe their particular vertical, and then you utilize the automation to go out and go, okay, you know what, we just got like a block list of, you know, this, these 700 URLs um, from however many feeds. Are those actually in our, our, our firewall rules already, right? Do we have um, items that are coming in, that, you know, that, that we've already got set ahead of time so that they're not going back and simply, you know, reacting to a, a detection from some other tool. They're proactively going ahead and using and using an, an automation to go, let's get these in right away. It doesn't matter if, if they're there or not, but we'll get it in ahead of time. I think what happens is, is that over, over top of time, as they're doing this, and this isn't something where it's like an instant switch on, um, their overall security posture and, increases which honestly is going to then lower their you know it's going to mitigate more risk for them and i think in the course of time that's where the business value comes in because they become known as a company that actually does you know i mean i think we've all heard it you know somebody gets breached take our security we take security seriously okay you, you, that that's good but i think if you have companies that are doing this ahead of time that does show that they take it seriously so if you've got a company i mean come on face it it's 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 a matter of you know have you been breached yet that's what it's going to come down to but if you can prove that you've been doing things ahead of time i think that really increases your business value as a company out there to go yeah you know what we we do take it seriously we this is what we have in place this is what we're constantly doing to make sure our posture is better so i think from an automation perspective that's that's probably a good place to start very insightful how about you scott yeah, I, I would say that I agree with pretty much everything that, that Stan said there. And I, I think to take it a step further, like when I think about when I think about cybersecurity and security in general, um, the thing that's interesting about it is that you're investing in a specific outcome, right? So businesses as you take investment and you want an outcome to occur. But in this case with security, your your outcome is for something not to happen and is, as opposed to something to happen, right? And so when we start looking at how we can turn security from a purely preventative and like, you know, risk mitigation type of type of activity into something that can provide real value to the business, I think of it in terms of converting your resources from a not occurrence to actionable, productive, uh, you know, things to actually happen through security, right? Whether that's tangentially, like like Stan was saying, through, you know, things like your brand, things like being able to uh, like you know, protect, protect yourself legally, uh, mitigate the risk through insurance, all those types of things. But uh, when I'm thinking about how how to convert that in an automation and AI perspective, um, it really involves understanding the needs of the business, right, as, as makes sense. But but what we're really trying to do is, like, even just at, at a most basic level, if you can minimize the cost 
that's a huge win that actually can be converted into something that is that is real and actual on the other side. Right. So uh, if you decrease the cost of that not outcome while still maintaining the ability to execute on having that mitigation or putting off how long it's going to be until you get breached like that has a, a noticeable material impact to your bottom line. So the, the example specifically that comes to mind is I see this all the time. Uh, we Every organization has an army of analysts that they either outsource to uh, through a third party or they, you know, outsource to, you know, do like a whole bunch of contractors to try to sift through uh, and do these repetitive manual tasks. And so uh, we see that all the time. And the trick is to make sure that we can preserve the outcome that those hundred analysts are still doing while not having to, you know, have that cost of the hundred hundred outcomes because uh, you know, that's, that's the, that's the real trick in the, the balancing act you have to, you have to do. So when you look at it from that perspective, in my, in my mind, the automation opportunities are, are everywhere, right? You, it's, you shift from purely a security mindset to a business mindset and say, oh, we're actually in the business of business process automation, not security itself, right? There's so much around security and the security is the outcome. But, you know, as, as Stan said, right, it's, automating collection of vulnerability data. It's automating uh, a block list. So your, your hundred analysts can be two analysts, right? There's, there's so many opportunities here beyond like just SOAR, beyond just vulnerability management. You look at GRC tools and compliance and compliance is a huge burden, right? And so being able to just start automating things like, for example, great example, let's automate the mapping of vulnerability technical findings to controls from a compliance framework, right? Like that's, that's to me, an, an area that's ripe for, for innovation that not a whole lot of folks have done a good job of. And so that probably has a, you know, noticeable impact on the GDP of every country that needs to do compliance in, in my mind. So, so to me, there, there's huge opportunities everywhere. Thanks, Scott. How about you, Stefan? Yeah, I completely agree with you guys. Um... I come from a little different area. My background is from network security, so I'm getting the question more or less frequently uh, where organizations, well, ask the questions whether I need secure connectivity or connectivity only. And I agree with you guys. It's The question is not if it's going to happen, but when it's going to happen. And um, yeah, also considering the background here, I do understand that security for some organizations out there really is a burden, uh, not just a cost, but also a pain because it's, you know, over the last 20 years, the IT security industry and so did we created systems which are not maintainable anymore and nobody understands them because it became uh, by far too, too complex and with the background of lack of knowledge, uh, lack of knowledge we're facing, it is fair that the organizations ask whether they really need that or not, but I think we need that complete change in, in paradigm and architectures to use automation and AI, like you guys mentioned, avoid those stupid repetitive tasks and make it consumable and maintainable also with a small team that focuses actually on, on the exciting parts of their job and not on, on the repetitive um, tasks and yeah, to get it to the point, I, I think we need to get to a perception where security is, or secure connectivity is the enabler for other business purposes, but the question should not be whether security is actually necessary, but security should be built into the solution from the very beginning. So that question uh, just doesn't arise from, from the beginning. And then uh, security can be an enabler for other use cases. like. It's my daily business. We provide secure connectivity, but nobody is doing that just for the sake of having it. They want to do something else with it, like, I don't know, collect data for predictive maintenance or something like that. But that can create a pure, a pure business value based on that means of transport that we provide. I think you bring up something very important, Stefan, with, with, you know, these legacy systems and, you know, the need to keep them secure and, and the transport with them, right? Sometimes I see cybersecurity as an enabler to modernization right, of, of the various platforms. And right, we, we understand that this platform is a risk and, and it's you know a, a enabler for the business, right? It's a business, um, uh, whether it's a differentiator, it's the way that they do business, et cetera, but you know, it, it hits the bottom line there. And 
an approach to modernization can change the way that the business operates in, in a good way. So security can be kind of the, the force behind that approach of modernization, which can help tr you know, digital transformation uh, for, for an organization. So it's, it's a great opportunity and, and sometimes can be that, that kind of kick in the pants that it needs to, to move things forward. So within security operations and governance teams, businesses today are experiencing a volume of compliance requirements, uh, threats, vulnerabilities, and exposure that they've never seen before. The teams are understaffed, the risks are not adequately mitigated, um, whether that's from a timely perspective or, or compliance perspective. And the threat landscape is changing um, before operations teams can take effective action. So, um, Stefan, my question to you is, will automation platforms solve our security scale and performance problems? To answer that, yes, I do think so, absolutely. Um, you mentioned uh, during the introduction, the also constantly changing threat landscape that we are facing today and what we've seen happening in the world since the last two years, I'd say, with the beginning of the pandemic, the first big uh, or the next big uh, ransomware wave began up until yeah, Log4J back in December and what we're now seeing uh, in cyber war with the Ukraine that has is not limited to the region anymore but uh, ongoing worldwide. I do believe, yes, that automation in the eye is the only way to get that under control considering the information we collect and like I've mentioned before, the, the analysis in the aggregation consolidation of the data is really um, key to to be able to react and to cope with that amount of data. But I'd also like to mention here, um, like uh, Scott said in the very beginning, we are at the beginning of AI and automation, and then it's far, far away from robots controlling the world and machines making decisions for us. It's really, there is so much room for improvement with the tools that we currently have. So we should start using them to, well, get on, on top of the situation and be able to deal with all the data we have. So Stan, should we automate as much as possible or be very selective on how automation is used? And especially in the context, right? We're, we're kind of in these beginning stages of things. Um, and where, do we, where do we go and how do we start? Yes, automate as much as possible, but be selective. <laughs> <laughs> it's um you know i use the phrase oftentimes when we're when we're talking with customers and they're and, and they're looking at automating um items is, is you have you have to know what your processes are so if i look at it purely from um i'll keep i'll keep this one to like let's say the like a sock layer uh so to speak um you have to know your processes um you have to be able to identify where the gaps are you have to be able to um Areas that areas that can be automated and should be automated versus um, areas that are still require eyes on class. Um, you know, there was a few years ago. There's a there was a banner um, up at RSA that said, "Yes, I blocked the CEO off and CEO off the network." Said no one ever. Um, and it's you know automating automating simply because you can uh, doesn't mean that you're your risk mitigation is better. In actual fact, I would I would probably argue that it's going to be it's going to be worse, um, because automating a bad process just means that you're now automating a bad process at scale. Because that's the whole that that's the whole point, right? You want to be able to, you know, you know, to Scott's point, you know, we've got like a hundred analysts doing something. We want two analysts to be able to do it, um, but you have to know you have to know what, what you're doing on that side of it. If you know if you know, knowing your processes, um, it if we've started with clients who just don't have any processes. If you don't have any processes, get somebody to, to help you with your processes, right? Like get those things in place or how you're going to react, how you're going to respond, or, you know, how are you going to move, like we talked before, from a, um, a preventative, a, a reactive state into more of a more of a preventative state. Um, only after you really understand your processes, um, can you use automation and AI as a force multiplier in there, right? It's it's not like these things are just going to, you're going to let loose and they're just going to magically, you know, take care of everything for you. And, oh, we've got this completely autonomous system that's going to just take care of all of our security needs. Um, it's not going to happen. 
right? It's it's it has to be well defined, planned, and and done in a strategic manner. Well, thank you. So Scott, we oftentimes see an imbalance, as what Stan is kind of talking about, about potential efficiency gains and the effort to create and maintain a reliable and effective automation platform or, or mechanism. So how do we find that balance to take advantage of automation and AI effectively? Yeah, this is a, this is a, this is a big question. So um, I, to Stefan's, to Stefan's point earlier, um, I know Monday morning, sometimes I wish that the machines were closer to taking over the world than they are <laughs> uh, because I, I hate that giant, that giant crush of emails on Monday mornings. But um, yeah, to, to Stan's point, I think, you know, Technology is only part of the answer, right? It, it's just an enabler of your enterprise and what you're trying to accomplish. And the thing that, that nobody wants to talk about is that automation is actually really hard to do. Like, it's, it's great to say, I want to automate everything. But when you start digging down into it, it's, it's like that iceberg uh, picture that everybody loves, where it's like, it just gets more and more difficult and bigger and bigger the, the, the more you look at it. Right. Like a Van Gogh painting. It just kind of keeps going. But um, like even as an example of that, like just data integration is really difficult. Right. Like there are companies like MuleSoft and others that have just built an entire sets of billion dollar businesses around just integrating the data. And then and that's not even like storing the data. That's just like that's just connecting the data. And then you go from connecting the data to managing the data to doing something with the data. And there's just there's so many different aspects of it. And, and so the opportunity is huge there. So, so the efficiency gains are, are vast, right? But you have to balance that with the understanding that you need to make sure you automate the correct things. And you want to start with the low hanging fruit. And oftentimes that's with your most, um, your most arduous and manual processes that you have the most people on. And then as you're automating it, you should also do some sort of retro, retrospective thinking of, is this the, the right process in general? Can we actually do this a better way? And, and that requires thinking at a higher level that, that we don't often see uh, in enterprises, right? The, the people and the processes are the most important part of it. And then the technology is just, it just enables it. So, so when you're trying to find that balance, it's very, very personal. Um, you need to figure out what your business's, you know, kind of risk appetite is, how they want to do things. But like we've seen stuff where people say, hey, we want to automatically ingest and correlate all of our vulnerability data together. And so that way we can assign it to the correct teams to work on. And then they, what they do is they, they click export to Excel and they, they've aggregated all this data, they export it to Excel, and then they just hand it to somebody on their desk. And so, you know, it's great to automate, but you have to understand where you're trying to get to. So it, it's striking that balance is a very difficult challenge. So, you know, kind of thinking about this, I guess, you know, choosing areas that we want to automate and you know, leverage AI is it important to have KPIs associated with that? And I guess this is just a, a general question that you know, whoever wants to answer that. Do we need a way to measure the effectiveness of automation and AI, or, or you know, is that an important aspect of kind of starting off with, with some of these things? Maybe a quick, uh, quick note from my side of it. I think at at the layer that we work on, I think the KPIs that are already getting getting tracked will showcase what AI and automation will do. So you mentioned in the beginning, like MTT, you know, MTTR and MTT uh, D and um, types of reports. I think if you're properly using AI and automation, you're going to see those numbers drop dramatically. And I think that's going to probably, at least from, from our perspective, where we sit in the industry, that's going to be the first impacted number that, that, that people are going to see. So I don't know if there's necessarily in our area a specific one that uh, that says, "Oh, we're going to now measure AI and 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 automation." I think I think I think you're going to see it impact other KPIs that are already in place. Yeah, and and to that to that point too, I mean, like even in the startup world, right? They, you know, there's all these metrics you can track about your business, but when it really comes down to it, there's only a handful that you actually throw up on your Power BI dashboard and track every single day. And the rest kind of just feed into that. And so, you know, the, the smaller and smaller KPIs kind of get pushed further and further down the organization. So like maybe within a team, there might be a KPI that says, hey, you know, how how much are we automating this particular process? But then, you know, there's 10 other of those processes that are being automated and they roll up to these these bigger KPIs, which should capture, uh, you know, if you're doing it right, hopefully they should capture the uh, <laughs> the efforts that you're doing. Thanks a ton of sense. 
So uh, the the uh, risk is, you know, we're, we're talking about it here within an organization is it's very individual and organizational choice. So when it comes to managing risk, how does an organization decide that is appropriate to allow AI and automation to manage aspects of cybersecurity? Um, so, you know, to, to add a, maybe a little bit more context in there, right? How do we decide where to invest? What do we trust? Do we trust AI and automation to deliver the the risk reduction that we're really looking for? Uh, with this. So, Scott, any thoughts? Yeah, this. I mean, this is a standard just like security security paradigm, right? And and so like my my original background was physical security design, and you had a very similar type of uh, type of workflow, right? It's you know, you've got things like, hey, we want to automate badge scanning, get users into the building, right? And if that, if if you automatically do that in a, in a, and your false positive or false negative rate is high enough, that can have a real impact to your, to your business. So, you know, when you're looking at, at doing this in the cyber realm, there, there are very similar types of, of scenarios. So, you know, the way that we t- ch- tend to break it down is generally there's like a, there's a matrix. So when we're now we're thinking about risk, not just in the, like, the security sense, but we're thinking about risk in the context of business risk, right? What's the what's the value of the thing that we that we could potentially break versus how easy is it? And there's this and what the potential uh, kind of upside is, right? So when I think of the matrix, I think of like kind of like a four square thing where you've got you know high high criticality uh, thing with a high chance of breaking, you know low criticality thing, low chance of breaking, high criticality thing, low chance of breaking, right? And so you have to figure out and define this risk matrix for your organization. And, and then start applying that methodology to all of the processes that you're thinking about automating. And, and that tends to work out really well, but because you're, again, you're leading with process and you're leading with the, hey, what can we actually, you know, methodically and quantitatively start automating at scale um, without saying, hey, let's go automatically patch a vulnerability on a critical server and take down a, a thing that processes $3 million in credit card transactions a minute, right? That's stuff that we've seen happen when you start getting a little too crazy with it. So it's it's understanding what you can and can't automate and then what your your organization's risk tolerance is. But yeah, we, we generally start with that that matrix there. That's what we think. What are your thoughts, Dan? Uh, 100% on with Scott. Um, I'm going to sound like a broken record again because for, for us, it always comes back to the process, right? Like... Um, if you're if you're if you've got a good set of processes um, that you're working with, then look at look at look at what those processes are. Look at the steps in those processes. Um, you know, get the ability to like semi-automate, right? Like have have like a have like a human check and balance there that is, um, you know, less manual than like a cut and paste, but just like they can click a button and 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 have it move forward. Once that's watched for a, a little while where you got, you know, some fairly close eyes on glass in the process and you've got some automations running in there, I think, you know, after that's been tested for a while, it might take a month or two, depending on the complexity of uh, of the process, um, you know, then become more comfortable with, with, with automating it. So given time to see outlier, you know, there's always going to be some type of outlier case that, that happens within, within those processes. Um, Certain things like I'll just use a maybe a, a concrete example. You know, um, you know, IOC or artifact enrichment um, can be automated with little or no risk, right? If you're looking at you know the beginning of a reactionary item and alerts come in, it's you know that alert's probably going to have a bunch of things that can be enriched uh, from other sources. Automating that side of the enrichment process is, should be straightforward. Like there's there's no risk in there really at, at at all. In actual fact, I would say you're probably mitigating risk because analysts aren't having to manually do a process to get the information, which means there's less chance of them making a mistake. You know, once you're comfortable with that, um, you know, start removing the, start removing the human checks and balances Uh, may take time, but I think it's probably the best way that, that they, that organizations can be comfortable, get comfortable with automating it. Right. And, and, and have, you know, have a rollback in, in place. If, if you've set an automation up, you've got to have a way of being able to turn that, turn that off if something suddenly goes sideways, so, you know, to Scott's point, you know, if you've got a, if you've got a server that, that, you know, is dealing with 300 million in credit card items, you know, every single minute, and you've automated the process of blocking internal IP addresses the moment that something funny happens on them, that server goes down, the, the business impact compared to, you know, the, the 10, 15 minutes that's going to take an analyst to check it, um, 
might not be a process that you want to go and automate directly at that particular point in time. The the, the risk is going to be just too high there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love I love that example. <laughs> it's a, it's, a, it's but it's a true. It's lie. It's facts. <laughs> Stefan, I, I, and, and actually all of you guys, you know, we see this oftentimes when it comes to like, critical infrastructure and so forth, and you know, all of your platforms certainly are, are participating in that type of protection, but right, critical infrastructure, you know, there there's, could be casualties associated with, with shutdowns of things, and especially um, you know, doing an automation that maybe just is not meant at that moment and right and we're now all of a sudden we impact some sort of critical communication path so what do you think Stefan? when it comes to to managing risk what's the appropriate level in types in those types of situations uh, good question yeah no, I, I do work a lot with customers in uh, critical infrastructure and industrial areas and usually for them availability is more important than security or than anything else so they try to keep their systems operating because the damage is huge but uh, like uh, Scott explained earl earlier, risk management is defined in a matrix and basically each risk is categorized by a probability and the impact that it can have. And I think the important part here with AI and automation is that the, especially the probability can easily change overnight. So what we've seen, for instance, with Log4J, uh, just before Christmas, all of a sudden there were millions of vulnerable systems out there in the world that just appeared on basically like that and nobody knew where they are. So uh, we cannot achieve 100% security and that's also not what organizations want because at a certain point they're not gonna spend uh, money for a risk that is never ever going to happen. But we have to know where the few percents are that we're not protecting and that can literally change overnight. So the only way again is automation and AI to keep up with that, but not for automated remediation, but making a proposal to a security operations team or to CISO or CEO to put some countermeasures in place. Um, I think, especially in critical inf infrastructure, based on my experience and the conversations I've had with customers, we are far away from automatic blocking of threats, but the detection is, is key. <laughs> Yeah, it certainly. It, it, I think I agree. We're pretty far away from automatic, but right, we need that visibility. And when when that we need to take action, we can't turn it into a manual process. We do have to have at least some some semi automation, right? Whether it's you know, user initiated um, or or um, you know a little bit of both, right? If the AI is making the suggestion, and then the you know, user is is determining that this is the correct behavior especially when it comes to protecting critical. Well, thank you to our panelists. That wraps up our session today. Um, thank you, Stan Engelbrecht from D3 Security for joining us today. Very insightful. Thank you, Scott Cooper from Nucleus Security. Appreciate your insights. And thank you, Stefan Schockinger from Barracuda Networks for joining today and, and all of your valuable input that you've, you've provided. So until next time, thanks again for everyone Thank joining you. today. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.